Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. While well, Indigenous people are transforming their lives and their communities, and they're sharing their stories in their own voices. Let's see how in this special episode of Our Vancouver. Coming up, highlights from CBC Vancouver's Indigenous Junior J School, where students got hands-on training in journalism. And how a Cree artist is combining contemporary art with traditional teachings to promote positivity among young people. But first, what led a woman from a northern reserve to pursue a career as a doctor? Well, this has been an exceptional year to graduate, and our next guest is an exceptional grad from UBC's Northern Medical Program. Randy George is Wet'suwet'en on her father's side and Métis on her mother's side. Randy, welcome. So nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to be a part of this. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to where you are now. I mean, you didn't set out to be a doctor at first. What, what was the turning point for you? I didn't even consider um, being a doctor. It's not something that I had thought of. I was born and raised on reserve. So seeing an Indigenous doctor was not something I had even laid my eyes on. I hadn't heard about it. So it's not something that was really in my head as something that I could do. Um, all I knew was that I liked science. I loved biology. So I started that degree at UNBC here in Prince George. And I got to third year and sort of started to panic because I was nearing graduation and I didn't know what I was going to do with my degree because I didn't like field work and I didn't like lab work. So I was talking to my auntie one day and she said, you know, you should be a doctor. And I started laughing because I actually thought she was kidding. And she just gave me this strange look and she's like, why are you laughing? And I was like, I can't be a doctor. And she said, you know, you're a straight A student at university. Why can't you be a doctor? And so she kind of had me stumped. And so I decided to look into it and found out that I just had to add a few more things to my degree. Um, and then I'd have all the prerequisites. And I joined the pre-medical club at university. I started volunteering weekly at the hospital to kind of look into it. And then after graduation, I worked in the medical field for a little while. Um, I was a medical office assistant at Central Interior Native Health in Prince George here working with the Indigenous and disadvantaged population. And that's when I realized that it was absolutely what I had to do. You know, it really combined my love of science, my love of people, my wanting to help and my wanting to educate and advocate um, for my people or other marginalized populations. And so I applied to medical school and I, and I got in. Well, it's great that you had that moment of clarity. Yeah, this is absolutely what I want to do. Auntie, thank you very much for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know that you've, you've also expressed, uh, you know, a hope to build kind of a bridge between Indigenous people and the medical community. So where do you see the gaps right now? You know, there's um, a lot of mistrust, I think, and misunderstanding between uh, a lot of the Indigenous population and a lot of the the Western um, European type uh, medical model and situation, you know, and we have a lot of historical things that have really contributed to that. Um, obviously colonization, um, residential schools, Indian hospitals, and those kinds of things that's really um, built in this mistrust that's being passed along to generations. And I mean, we've got to face that we still have racism um, in society to this day, and that puts a big barrier. So I wanted to kind of be able to walk both worlds, you know, be an Indigenous person from the reserve who is connected to my culture and my people and my lands and all of that, but also be somebody in medicine um, who studies the European and Western model, but kind of marries them and kind of works on um, our Indigenous ways of teaching about health was on the medicine wheel. So we considered, you know, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual health. All four components required for whole health, and that's really how I view health. I think all four components are really important, which is one of the reasons I chose to go into psychiatry as a specialty. Where do you see yourself, you know, down the road? Let's, let's say five or ten years with uh, Dr. Randy George. Yeah, 
I would love to be back home. Um, I plan to come back to Prince George. I want to work primarily um, in PG. I've been here for over 20 years now. Um, this really is my community. I worked in the medical field for six years prior to medical school. So I want to be primarily based here, hopefully back at Central Interior Native Health, which, you know, really um, changed me as a person um, and as a professional. And I would also like to be outreaching to other remote and Indigenous communities. And eventually, I would love to go back home to Hegelget and, you know, be a part of that community and, and my people and back on my territories. Well, congratulations again on your graduation. We wish you all the best in the future, Randy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Harvey at Second Beach in Stanley Park, and this is our Vancouver. Well, another local woman is drawing on her background to help others. Jessica Slater is a Cree artist in Surrey, and she's hoping that young Indigenous people can draw strength from large-scale portraits of themselves. My name is Jessica Slater. I'm from Ocheque Sipi Cree Nation, and I am Indigenous. I've always been a painter for as long as I can remember. You know, our teachings speak of that each and every one of us are born with a sacred gift, and for me, I wanted to use those gifts to benefit and um, our communities and to sort of rewrite a lot of the conversations that were happening. So Young Artist Warriors is um, a group that I started in Montreal and its mandate is to actively honour traditional knowledge and protocol while fostering positive identity through the arts. So I just know for me like how much I struggled with identity growing up and feeling like something was missing and feeling shame and guilt and not knowing, no, not knowing why. And it wasn't until I connected with my culture that I found out that that experience is common for Indigenous youth. We know now that there's 8,000 Indigenous youth under the age of 26 in Surrey, so bringing visibility to them was really important to me and then also highlighting how big the population is, so each star represents 1,000 Indigenous people. National Aboriginal Day is, um, I think it's important because it's bringing visibility to our population and our issues and the beauty of our culture and I think just providing a platform for us to really look at um, how we are working together and saying, you know, uh, we, we're going to do this for ourselves. Coming up, putting the spotlight on the musician who won this year's CBC Searchlight competition. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, one of Vancouver's biggest housing projects is the Squamish Nations development just south of downtown. It's worth $3 billion, and it could transform more than 10 acres of prime real estate. Tanya Fletcher has more on that. This is uh, monumental. It's, it's, it's massive. It's unprecedented. It's called Sinoc, a $3 billion housing development now approved by the Squamish Nation in the heart of Vancouver. Eleven towers will be home to 6,000 units, most of them rentals designed to put profits back into the community. When the money starts coming in, the nation will be able to make major investments into community amenities like daycares and schools and housing. The mega project is on 12 acres of prime waterfront real estate. Because this is reserve land, it doesn't need to go through the often lengthy zoning and consultation steps and that could mean fast-tracking some much-needed rental stock in a city still struggling with an affordability crisis. So this is now getting into serious value, serious city building. This urban development expert calls it a new era of cooperation, one that's reflected in the city skyline. First Nations have an opportunity to shape one of the most dynamic cities in the world and bring to it those things that not only preserve their culture but add to ours. So that's way beyond than just a development proposal. The untapped potential is being recognized all around the region. MST Development Corporation is an Indigenous-led real estate company, a partnership between the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. It's widely viewed as the next big power player in the industry. It's a new world for the nations all throughout Canada. 
Top real estate executive David Negrin was brought on to be the company's CEO. He says the First Nations are currently unlocking a combined 160 acres of prime property on four sites slated for major development across the Lower Mainland. I said this three years ago, make no mistake that the First Nations will be major developers within Canada, and that has happened now. And the opportunities for them are, are vast. And, and, you know, they've waited a long time. A long time coming for communities glad to have a significant seat at the table. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. This is our Vancouver. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music, coming to you from home with some good news about the artists who have emerged as winners from our Searchlight competition, our yearly hunt for Canada's best undiscovered talent. Back in 2018, our Searchlight winner was Halifax hip-hop hero, Aquaculture. Check him out. And I'm happy you in now. You can tell your grandchild you may love to this how to hear now. Cause I'm proud. Just control the crowd and we got it. I'm sharing with you the things that I found. You claim you know you want to stay, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. All right. That is Aquaculture with his recent single, I Doubt It, from his album Legacy that was recorded at the National Music Centre in Calgary. That was part of Aquaculture's prize for winning our Searchlight competition back in 2018. And I am very happy to report that Aquaculture's album just got voted onto the long list for the $50,000 Polaris Music Prize, honoring the best record in Canada, the critically acclaimed record, alongside artists like Sarah Harmer, The Weeknd, Kay Trinata, and others. Congratulations to Aquaculture from everyone here at the CBC. In other Searchlight news, our 2020 winner was the two-spirit powerhouse pop artist, Shawnee, our first ever Indigenous winner in our 12 years of Searchlight. Shawnee won Searchlight back on March 5th of this year on the strength of this song. Building a wall, I call it God. Save me from the war, take me away from it all. Run this place to the ground, take me away from the south. If I don't leave, I would drown everyone for themselves. Can't do no more, my shapes won't fit. I sabotage every chance I get. So I'm building a wall, building a wall, building it up. Yeah, there you go. That's building a wall from Shawnee a Mohawk artist from the Six Nations of the Grand River on her mother's side. Now, as I mentioned, Shawnee won this year's Searchlight competition on March 5th. As you well know, just 10 days later, our world changed, and a lot of the Searchlight prizes that Shawnee won were suddenly off the table temporarily, such as her scheduled performance at the CBC Music Festival. But Shawnee has taken it all in stride, and in the meantime, she has released a brand new single called Don't Go. You had me at hello. Hey now, girl, come on, let's go. I know what you're looking for. Spinning fast, we'll take it slow. Come on over, baby. We can talk all through the night. You've been walking back and forth, running circles in my mind. That is Don't Go, the brand new song from two-spirit Mohawk singer Shawnee, the winner of CBC Music's Searchlight competition back in March. To check out more on this amazing artist, go to cbc.ca slash searchlight. Don't Go is available now, and Don't Go by Shawnee and I Doubt It by Aquaculture are the songs that you need to add to your Quarantunes playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence. Stay safe, keep Canadian music alive, and I'll check in with you again soon. Coming up, 
Cross Country Checkup host Duncan McHugh shares his story about trying to learn how to hunt with the Cree. Welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, you may recognize their voices and faces on the CBC. Duncan McHugh, host of Cross Country Checkup. Angela Sterrett, Reconcile This columnist on CBC Radio here in BC. But here, they share parts of their personal journeys with students of journalism at CBC Vancouver's Indigenous Junior J School. Hello, I'm Edgar Villanueva Cruz. I am from Vancouver, British Columbia, and I am of the Casca and Teltan people from the northern British Columbia border. And I am here today to learn some journalism skills in order to help with my career path in being a political figure or a revolutionary. I'm from Comox Valley. I came here all the way from there. And I want to learn about cameras and journalism today. I'm Mexican and Ojibwe. I'm from Ecole Salish Secondary and I'm really interested in learning about like journalism. Cree Métis, and I'm very proud to be here. Wow, what a beautiful sight. I would say, Ichiwayo, my CMs, which traditional welcome of the Musqueam First Nations. We've always been a welcoming people. It's also runs through our blood as indigenous people. As you know, CBC Studios resides on the unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nations. We have never given up our land. We've never sold it. We've never traded for it. As you know, it has been taken from us. If you go back in time and history, and right here resided hundreds of years ago, a Sinewath Lalem, a house of teachings. Today you're in CBC studios, it's a modern day house of teachings, a Sinewath Lalem. In here you're going to learn to experience today more importantly, to go into journalism and the art of that field, not limit yourself just to go into studies that they kind of earmark first. They go to First Nation studies or go to other programs, but go into journalism. Musqueam First Nations has always been a great communicator. Anin. Uh, Moro Ankodans Indigenous Cas, Mayingan, Nedo Dem, Chippewas of Georgina Island and Dunjaba, uh, Toronto and then the uh, Anishinaabe and now Bindigan, Bindigan uh, CBC Vancouver. Uh, so what I just uh, shared with you is is a, my traditional name, uh, my clan, the community that I'm from, and that's the way that we we've been taught as Anishinaabe Nini to to introduce ourselves when we're speaking in public. When I was 11 years old, uh, I was born in southern Ontario. That's our, t our t territory for the Anishinaabe. Uh, but when I was 11 years old, we moved to James Bay, northern Quebec, to live amongst the Cree. And uh, I'll tell you, it was, it's always tough moving uh, when you're that old. But it was particularly tough for me because I was an Ojibwe kid who all of a sudden was living amongst the Cree. Uh, and I went from being the only native kid in my school to a place where they were calling me Wamstagushio, which means white man, because I didn't speak Cree. Uh, in in Chisasabi, where uh, we were living, they were very much still living a traditional lifestyle, uh, going out and hunting and trapping, and that was not the way that I grew up in southern Ontario, just outside of Toronto. And so I had a lot to learn, and it was a very tough move for me uh, in a lot of different ways. But the Cree set about to, to teach me to hunt. And when I graduated from high school, my dad asked me, he said, would you like to spend, instead of going off to university, would you like to spend time out on the trap line? And I said, yes, I would. I would like to do that. So I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, it's a story about uh, five months that I spent living on a trap line. Uh, and I ended up writing a book about it called The Shoe Boy. And so I want to play just a little bit of video to, to explain to you what, uh, what that time was like for me. I rarely share stories about the season I spent living in the wilds of northern Quebec, 
with the Cree Trapper and his family, but tonight, this feels good. We trapped otter, muskrat, and beaver, I tell them. We snared rabbits. We hunted grouse, ducks, and ptarmigan. We shot a caribou and a bear. In this crowd, I may as well be talking about my trip to Mars, but I'm not whipping this story out as a badge of aboriginality, like a Costco card that proves I'm a member of the club. No, this story is like the rosary beads in my mother-in-law's purse, worn and comforting, yet a symbol of mystery. It's been over 20 years since I went hunting in the bush with Robbie Matthews Sr., and I'm still trying to unpack what I learned there. So, some of those, that's Iu Ichi, what they call Cree land. And, and it is one of the most beautiful places on the earth. And I had the privilege to be a hunter there for five months. And, and we flew into a cabin. Uh, we had to fly in. It was about an hour and a half by bush plane. And I was with Robbie Matthews Sr., who was an old man in about his 50s or 60s, and his wife, Sally, and his three sons, Adrian and uh, Bruce and Randy. And we lived in a one-room cabin that had no electricity. Uh, we heated it with wood, which we spent an awful lot of time trapping. Uh, we carried water from the lake. That's where we got our water from. We had no running water. We had an outhouse. Uh, I think we had, over that five months, I think we had two baths, <laughs> which we did uh, in a big metal tub. Uh, and I was the youngest, so I was like fourth in line when it came to washing our hair in that water. So uh, it was a whole different way of life for me. And you saw some of those pictures. We, we lived off of what we hunted. Uh, we shot large game, caribou and bear for sure. Uh, but we really lived off of the fish that we, that we caught and the small game, the rabbits and the ptarmigan. And it all looks neat and wonderful, and look how happy I was there. Uh, but that was kind of like my Instagram account, some of those pictures that you're seeing. It wasn't the whole story. Because the truth of the matter is, is I wasn't a very good hunter. <laughs> I didn't grow up that way. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't taught how to be a hunter. And that's why I wanted to go there and learn. But it was hard. And, and I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't very good at tying knots. And I didn't know how to set a fish net. And I didn't know how to see a rabbit trail. And I didn't speak Cree. And I was lonely for my family. And I was lonely for my girlfriend. And as the months went on and it got colder and colder, these frustrations and these difficulties got harder and harder for me. And though I was learning, and Robbie Matthew Sr. is a wise and, and generous elder, I was getting more and more frustrated because I couldn't provide the way that the other boys were providing. So one day I set out, and I was like, I'm going to change this. I'm going to stop being the guy that just washes dishes all the time and carries water all the time and sweeps up the cabin all the time. I want to be a big hunter like the other uh, boys that I was with. And I said, I'm going to bring home a beaver. And then I saw the beaver. He was starting to swim across the pond, and I saw his little head across the pond there, and I said, okay, one shot. I got one shot. And I took a deep breath, and then I took another deep breath, and I thought, everybody's going to be so proud of me. I'm ready. I'm going to do this. And I, and I took, and I looked, and I looked, and I took my shot, and I took a deep breath, and I went, pow! And I missed by a mile. <laughs> I missed by, like, this much! I missed his little head, and he slapped his tail, and he went under, and that was it. They were going to be in their lodge for a couple of days. They would never come back out. And I couldn't believe it. And so I started the long walk home, and I hadn't eaten all day, and I was cold, and I was so disappointed with myself. And I came to a hill, and I was looking out over Iu Ichi, and I sat down on a rock, and I just thought about all the things that I had done wrong over the past couple of months. And I thought about how I had tried so hard, and I just couldn't do these things. And I'm going to tell you something. I thought for a couple of hours about ending my life when I was sitting there with that rifle on my cradled on my knee. I thought about it long and hard. Then this little whiskey jack, this little whiskey chanish, they called him, little gray, gray jay, he came and he sat down 
He started hopping around me. They're thieves, those little guys. They're thieves. They come and steal things from the camp. Came and started hopping around me. And he kind of snapped me out of it, seeing that little bird. And I looked at him, and he was just looking at me. And I threw him a little piece of bannock, and he gobbled it up, and he flew off. And it snapped me out of it, that little bird. Failure is an important teacher. It's OK to fail. It's OK to make mistakes. Because when you make mistakes and when you fail, it means you're trying. If you're not making mistakes and you're not failing, it means you're not trying. And failure is one of the greatest teachers that we have. If you learn from those mistakes that you made, they make indelible lessons and teachings upon you that you will never, ever, ever forget. Trust me. So I hope today for you that you learn some skills about how to become storytellers, how to share your story, how to write books, and how to tell TV stories, and how to tell radio stories. I hope you learn a few skills like that, but I hope if you don't remember anything else about today, that you remember that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay. That's how we learn. And that's how you're going to become a stronger person. And I'm so, so, so very happy that you're all here today. It makes my heart very proud and warm to see you all. Jimmy Gwich, Miigwech Bizindoyek. Hello. Luam, Godich, Yin, Win, Gayanin, Alugiet, Amshua, Amia, Amia, Slewatooth. Masquiam, Skohotmash, Kem Kemle, Amase. I just said welcome to you all in my language, Kixan, and uh, good morning. And I also said uh, thank you to the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Skohotmash people for having me on their territory, which is called Kem 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 Kemle. I just have been learning this. It's called Place of the Maple Trees. I'm bursting with joy right now to see you all. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm very excited. Um, this has been a dream come true for me. This is something I've, I've fought hard for my entire career, to be standing here in front of you with the potential that you might be coming into what Johnny calls our house at CBC. I'm so honored that you're here today. I'm so grateful. Um, I want to talk to you about my journey and about chasing your dreams and how important that is and how, as Duncan said, that many times in your life and many times in your career, you'll fall down and you'll fail. And the more successful you are, the more times you'll fall down, the more times you'll, you'll fail because, as Duncan said, you're trying. Uh, my grandfather, Walter Sterrett, was being groomed his entire life to be a hereditary chief. Um, my uncle ended up taking on that role and became Wigach the hereditary chief of the house of the Big Raven, of the Lakibu, the Wolf Clan. So all my life I grew up watching my family be strong, amazing, incredible storytellers, warriors. They, they fought in one of the largest Aboriginal rights and title cases in our history called the Dalgamoch. During that case, one of my uncles testified about our territory, that we belonged here, that this is our land, that we've used these grease trails for hundreds of, or tens of thousands of years. I grew up thinking 100,000, but I can say 10,000, just to keep it safe. Um, and testified in this court case because the, the colonials, the colonial government, the Canadian government was trying to say, you don't belong here. Your title and your land was extinguished at the time of colonization. Literally in the court case it said, because you eat pizza and drive cars. You're no longer indigenous. So my family fought really hard in this court case. And I learned about my grandmothers carrying these huge bent wood boxes of berries on their backs. And my uncles hunting for an entire community, fishing in our fishing holes, feeding the community, taking care of the land. But what happened was when I turned on the TV excited and anticipating to see my people, to be proud of my people, to see what I was being told through my people's eyes and our stories, I saw something very different. I saw a bunch of stereotypes. I saw people calling my people greedy, that we wanted more, that we were savages, that we were violent. What more did they want now, they kept on asking. And I was shocked. I was shocked to see that discrepancy of my people and then what I saw on TV, what I saw in the newspapers. 
what I saw, what I heard on the radio. And from that moment on, I didn't say, oh, that media, garbage media. I said, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to make a promise to myself to change the way that we are seen so that one day there'll be an accurate portrayal of our people on television. So I made that promise to myself, but it wasn't easy. I came from a very abusive home. I had abuse in the home. I had violence in the home. I was on the street when I was 14 years old and experienced a ton of violence there. But I always thought of that dream in my mind. I was very shy. I was very awkward. I didn't like to talk to people much. So I just sat down and I drew. And I wrote. I wrote stories. I wrote poems. And my pen became my counselor. And as I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I started to understand where I came from, who I was, I thought about my ancestors. I thought about the resilience. I thought about the lessons that they'd taught me through all that they'd been through. And then I thought about other people, other Indigenous people, whose stories were also being represented wrongly, negatively on, on television. And I started to think, maybe my pen could become an agent of change. And finally, someone here, when I knocked on that door, they opened it up. And they said, this is important. Your stories are important. Indigenous stories are very important. We need to hear more of them. You're right. You're right. We need to hear more and more and more Indigenous stories from Indigenous reporters, from Indigenous people who know these stories, who understand them, who have lived them, who aren't going to tell these stories riddled in stereotypes. You know, when you're, when you're young, and you're growing up, people are like, don't worry, it gets better. But it doesn't. <laughs> it never gets better. But you get stronger. You don't give up. You keep on going, and you keep on chasing your dreams. Coming up, part two of our highlights from CBC Vancouver's Indigenous Junior J School, featuring snotty nose res kids and the students themselves. Hi, welcome back to our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. So we've heard from two of the CBC journalists at 2019's Indigenous Junior J School in Vancouver. Now let's turn the mics and the cameras to the students and the hip hop duo Snotty Nose Res Kids. You know, all of our stories are different. We all have different upbringings. We all have different challenges in where we come from. I am a residential school survivor. I went to residential school. I know you can't tell because I look so young. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I did. And you know what? I made it out. And my sisters all made it out. My mother made it out, my late mother, and managed to bring us up as a single mom, six of us. And we've all led, from the colonial perspective, we've all led fairly successful lives and have had you know, great times as a family and, and great times in our careers. And we've had those challenges like Duncan talked about, uh, of, of our upbringing, our ways, our Snowyath, who we are as, as Hualmuk peoples, Indian peoples, First Nation people. And knowing what we had to persevere back then, and even in my generation, to your generation, my, my kids' generation, those challenges are still there. And don't think that us older adults don't know that. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought this would ever happen, that we'd have this opportunity for you uh, to, to be here, to learn from the best, to be able to come into this large building and have access. We don't expect all of you to be journalists and filmmakers. We would like it. We really would. There's so few of us out there that do this work. And having our voices, your voices, in the newsroom, in leadership roles, shaping our stories, shaping our newsrooms. We need you. It's cool to be able to relate with your, your parent about something you're really interested in. So keep that in mind as you move forward, okay? Because 
Don't let anybody tell you you can't do what you want to do. Okay, so uh, we're radio hosts and TV hosts. So, you know, a working environment for a TV host would consist of like an open environment, you know, you're pitching ideas, you're forming questions, making a schedule. Because everything has to flow, you know, it can't be 10 minutes late, as you said, it can't be 5 minutes late, it has to be on time, chop chop. So, you know, like, <laughs> So I'm just gonna get these inputs here. There's, there's two inputs. And really we always want the, the inputs set at zero so that whenever someone's listening to the audio, it sounds proper. Think of it as talking to your best friend or your grandma or your mom or somebody who you really love and trust who's on the other end listening to that in the headphones. You also wanna emphasize things and put some pauses in there so that it sounds really interesting to listen to. You got this. Just go whenever? Yeah, so we get a little closer to the mic. All right. Hi, my name is Isaac Williams from Twaston First Nation. You're listening to CBC Radio 1. That's 90.5 FM in Victoria. Oh my god, that was so good. We're not, we're not control, we're freaking out over here. Have you done this before? <laughs> really? Yeah. You're so good. I'm Ojibwe. I'm a member of the Fort William First Nation. Uh, which is a community in Thunder Bay, so I traveled a long way to be here because this is a really important day and, and having you, your, all your voices on the radio and is such an important thing because you're all powerful storytellers and you have such so much to give back, so I'm excited for you all to be here and to help out tonight. Hi, my name is Isabel Deroy. I'm from the Trondequichin, Lake Manitoba, and Ebb and Flow First Nation. You're listening to CBC Radio 1, that's 90.5 FM in Victoria. Right on! Yeah. Oh, so good! I want to learn about journalism. I want to learn how I can get involved with our community. Here they are. Snotty, nose, redskins! We're going to say some ignorant things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck. So if you feeling what we feeling, I'm going to need everybody to scream, yeah, yeah at the end yeah. of every line. Can you do that? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> All right, then. Let's try great. this. There's not enough money to make. Yeah. Give a young savage a break. Yeah. There's yeah. not enough food in my plate. Yeah. Give me a reason to pray. Yeah. Corinna, yeah. just let us go cray. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. But damn, I'm up in other place. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. My faces, they all look the same. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. I'm a savage from back in the day. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. Let's get it. Let's go there, yo. When that drum drops in the first time, I mean, yeah, everybody yeah, jump yeah, up and yeah. rage one time. Look, there's not enough money to make. Yeah. Give a young savage a break. Yeah. There's not, not enough food, food on my plate. plate. Yeah. Give me a reason to pray. Yeah. Great, just let us go crazy. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. God damn, I'm a bit out of place. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. The faces they all look the same. Yeah. I can remember my name. Yeah. I'm a savage from back in the day. Hey, one, I can two, remember two, my three, name. Let's go. Yeah. There's not enough food on my plate. Yeah. 
Give me a reason to pray. Yeah. Creator, just let us go cry. Yeah. I can't remember my name. Yeah. God damn, I'm a bit out of place. Yeah. I can't remember my name. Yeah. Your faces, they all look the same. Yeah. I can't remember my name. Yeah. I'm a savage from back in the yeah. day. I can't remember my name. Yeah. We've got great role models uh, in this territory, and the territory is all across uh, this side of Turtle Island. I got into this business after working uh, in the industry, uh, in another industry. I did a ton of different jobs. I worked at McDonald's. I was a security guard. Uh, I was unemployed for a long time. Um, and all it took was going to a little community college program. It was two years. It was relatively inexpensive. They taught me everything I needed to, to, to do. Uh, I got in, I started doing video journalism, operating a camera, writing, doing my own stuff. Um, and it, it really didn't require much other than me taking a bit of a risk. Hi, I'm Sydney Fowler. Hello, my name is Sean LaRochelle. Hi, I'm Ashley. You're watching Junior J School News. Us being able to tell our own stories for like people to hear because like there are still like a lot of stereotypes and like negative images that are pushed like alongside indigenous people. I think there's gonna be a sense of honesty with everything that I do, a sense of uh, uh, experience with what I've been through. Yes, I've learned a lot of stuff today. When I was growing up, I never saw the work of Indigenous journalists. I never heard them. I never saw them on TV. In fact, you saw a few Indigenous stories. You're, I think, the first generation to be able to see the work of other Indigenous journalists. We came here for you because you are our people. You're our future. Thank you, all of you. me feeling phony. I gotta move, gotta make money just like I'm Roni. And I gotta think about my ancestors and the way they fought, the resilience, it's just the key. No Alicia, but we gotta move. I say bye Felicia. If you don't got the time for me, I'm on my grind and I'm steady moving up. Listen to my voice. I don't got nothing but choice. I'm a revolutionary. You better be scary. I ain't no fairy. I don't fly around, I float. And I want a different kind of boat. What I'm trying to say is that just get out of my way. Let me move. I'm straight from the coup. Yeah. Hey, how are you guys doing? <laughs> to all the youths, you make can. some noise for yourself one time. Woo! If you living off the land, yuck, so yeah. If you stick it to the man, yuck, so yeah. If you die for your people, yuck, so yeah. If you see through the evil, yuck, so yeah. If you a storyteller, yuck, so yeah. If you listen to your elders, yuck, so yeah. If you speak your native tongue, yuck, so yeah. We forever young, yuck, so yeah. We sing it, yuck, so yeah. Sounding like a savage, I don't even understand him when he say that you the baddest. Survival is a habit. Rally after rally, I get it from my young. Bobby started like my daddy. We the streets like Aladdin. It's making me nostalgic. You got a guy who loved me. That translates to magic. My mama who gave me knowledge. Like Sonny, you could have it. I don't mean I'm cooking dope. But I've been trapping at the cafe when it's word to my granny. If y'all don't understand me, I'm thankful for the salmon. I'm providing for my family and I'm living off the land. Like the ones who did before me. I'll be passing on the story of the road to Bamako. And it's Sasquatch Habitat. Call me Yumba Gus. I can't the city back cause I'd rather have the bush. The rest is in the building. They afraid we coming up. The future's in our children. Yuck, so yeah. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you'll join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Goodbye for now.